Friday, April the 6th, 1979, and this is side one of take number 383. I got a request from a longtime listener uh, to give an overview of history, a one-hour tape, at least, probably one hour, with a resume of who is doing the conspiring, who is doing the assassinating, uh, what are the names of these particular people that gain from all of this, how did they get their power? What years were the turning points in their controlling the power? What agencies are involved? The important names. And so in about a week or two, when some of this news calms down, if it ever does, I have enough always just backlogged here to share with you. But I do think it's important to go into that, and I think I will do that for you in about two weeks. I think that the, the real strong conspiratorial ties begin in March 1891, that was just 88 years ago, with Cecil Rhodes, the British gentleman who went to South Africa and took out of their diamonds and gold and set up what was known as the Round Table Group in Britain, and the Rhodes Scholars uh, who were educated along his way of thinking that the British should establish a world order ruled by whites, and that the Americans could have part of that uh, operation. They put part of it on our continent because I, evidently it was too large for them to do all by themselves. After World War I, Colonel House was instrumental in forming the Council of Foreign Relations, and we'll go into that. And uh, Colonel House was a man from Texas who lived in England, and Herbert Hoover, the gentleman who brought us into the Depression, who also knew a lot about grabbing gold and oil and minerals overseas, uh, exploitation, became the president of the United States following World War I. Uh, the main family behind the American Council of Foreign Relations was the Morgan family. We'll go a little bit into the DuPonts, the Morgans, the Mellons, the Rothschilds. There's a lot of people that were behind this conspiracy, and often Rockefeller's name is predominant. But the Morgan family uh, set up the Council of Foreign Relations, and the Rockefellers donated the building. So in a couple of weeks, we will do an overview. I think that's essential from time to time. Of course, the news this week on everybody's mind is the story of the atomic plant and what went on in Pennsylvania. I don't want to repeat a lot that you've heard in the news during the week, and I'm sure you all followed it closely, but I'll just go to some what I thought were the highlights of the week that I want to remember on this tape and call attention and share with you. Just before the accident took place, uh, uh, this was March 28th, that the leaks began and the atomic plant had so much trouble. Uh, just uh, shortly before that, March the 14th, there was an article in the New York Times by Richard Holleran, Five Atomic Plants Ordered Shut Down, and it talks about five electrical generating plants having nuclear energy that were ordered to be closed within 48 hours because they couldn't withstand earthquakes, that there was an analysis of their ability to withstand earthquakes, and a special committee had been formed to raise questions of the overall issue of disposing of radioactive waste in underground depositories. This is March 14th, just uh, 14 days before the nuclear accidents. Can you imagine putting two and three billion dollars into nuclear plants and not knowing where the waste is going to go? There isn't a day that I don't see the headlines and realize that this is a totally insane society. And partner in the insanity is any person who puts up with that and doesn't cry or yell or scream and make some noise either to uh, protest or write public officials, call talk shows, and so forth. There are ways of making a voice heard. And anyone who sits back and accepts this uh, will get the consequences. Of it. it gives me no satisfaction always to sit back and say, I told you so. Um, and on the other hand, I just wonder 
what's in the minds of people that allow plants to be built without having any idea where the waste is going to go. Another column by Coleman McCarthy in the Washington Post. This is uh, March 29th, an important article, Thursday, March 29th, Nuclear Industry Chased by Doubts. It says five plants were closed by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission because of design error. This is this article incidentally was printed one day after the plant was closed down in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Um, McCarthy said five plants were closed because of design error, the ones I mentioned before. The Department of Health, Education, and Welfare says that the risk of cancer from radiation is more uncertain than ever. A committee representing 14 federal agencies reported that the ease of radioactive waste disposal has been oversold. The opening of the Karen Silkwood case in Oklahoma focuses public attention on both dangers of radiation and possible corporate wrongdoing. It goes into the movie coming out of um, Jane Fonda, the dramatic story of the uncertainties of nuclear power, the China Syndrome, a television documentary by journalist Paul Jacobs with new information on accidental contamination and government cover-up, which was also followed by massive cancer and leukemia. And the article goes on, the blow-up of dire publicity. All of this has left the nuclear boosters without an atom's worth of intelligence rebuttal. Uh, It also goes into the fact that Jerry Brown and Jane Fonda have been talking about the anti-nuclear energy for a long time in California, and they have. They've been wanting to use the solar energy. Uh, You would think that the people favoring nuclear um, escalation would shut up at least till some of the answers of this are in. But of course, we see James Schlesinger, the czar of our energy group, and John Conley, and I'll go into more detail on that, public officials pushing uh, the nuclear energy the very day and days after this plant caused so much trouble in Pennsylvania. Another article in the Washington Post, March 29th, that same day, nuclear a- nuclear accident turns a bonanza into a mixed blessing. And this article typifies the human interest stories that were on national television of people who don't know a thing about what they're talking about. They don't know what their children uh, will look like, the pregnant mothers, what the grandchildren will look like, what diseases will come, and if they'll have cancer, goiter, leukemia, uh, the consequences of the Harrisburg incident were not made available when the plant was built and so they interviewed people they have one woman saying I don't worry about it you see these lights burning in the house I owe it all to these plants another person interviewed said if you're going to die you're going to die another one said the plants as safe as anything else I don't think the government would let them do anything to endanger our health these are the kind of human interest stories that were on the news media and uh, I don't know where they find these people, but of course they're told that uh, it's safe, and when the plant goes up, they get a lot of jobs. Another article, a woman said her husband was a welder, and she was grateful because the money was good. He made 18 to $20 an hour on overtime at the Metropolitan Edison. And the husband said, I've already lost all my hair, and I'm sterile, so what else can they do to me? There's something very sick. It reminds me of the Jonestown acceptance of death, the ones that weren't murdered, that planned the suicide rehearsals that sit there and take it, Uh, there's this permeation in the air of death and wanting to die and thinking of suicide, and it it could become almost contagious that people give up their will to live. Another article in the paper last week, the town shrugs off the nuclear accident. One family said we had to accept it when we moved here, referring to the nuclear plant, is that it's something you could see. Maybe you'd worry about it later, but it doesn't bother me at all. This is a man that has dairy farms there for the Los Angeles Times. Many of you heard those comments during the week. And then, of course, uh, two days after the leaks began, there was an article in the San Francisco Examiner, hour by hour reports of leak keep worsening. And it gives you each hour, uh, and you've seen it in your newspapers, the various stories of how bad it was going to get. Another story, contradictions keep spewing out. Well, anybody who studied the murder of John Kennedy or Robert Kennedy or Martin Luther King or many other important murders and assassinations 
or studied events in history such as the killing of Abraham Lincoln or even the escape of the czars or the story of whether or not Adolf Hitler is alive or dead, the contradictions keep pouring and spewing out and new evidence comes in uh, to make the official story look pretty flimsy. And of course, large article in the San Francisco Chronicle, new contradictions. Very consistent, as I say, with all the other work I've done. Another article follows then during the week, nuclear plant planners did not foresee the bubble or the design reactor to handle it. This is from the Associated Press. The dangerous bubble that was lodged on the roof uh, was not foreseen when they built the building. The, the nuclear technicians were caught off guard. They hadn't anticipated the buzzle, bubble. They had to not designed the reactor to handle it. They had no plans for dealing it, with it. And Harold Denton, Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, agent, you saw him on national television, a new superstar, said, it's a new twist. They weren't expecting the bubble, and uh, yet it was built, and the force of the explosion cracked a four-foot-thick reactor wall, and radioactivity was escaping through the walls. Another article from the Los Angeles Times, on-site inspectors urged two years ago, but 23 of the 47 atomic plants still lack them. It was recommended by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission that they have inspectors on duty, and yet out of 47 sites, there are only 23 where, there anybody, where there's anybody checking out inspectors to see what is going on. You can imagine if, in terms of lives and energy, if a plant that's cost several billion dollars is shut down forever, and uh, we don't know how many people have been affected, how much land, the farming area, in terms of millions and millions of dollars plus the billions of the initial investment, if you multiply that times the 24 unguarded plants, this country could go totally bankrupt physically and financially, uh, building these things and then building new ones and backing them up and not having inspectors that were urged. They were urged two years ago and they didn't do anything about it. Then, of course, there's always the stories, cost of mishap in the millions. The merchants alone lost a million dollars in business last week. It's interesting if the men praise the plant and the women because they're making 18 to $20 overtime, they must take all of that money and go into the little town nearby or into Harrisburg and spend it right away at the company stores because there was a million dollars in business just last week, an ordinary weekday um, where people couldn't go to work and the town was empty. And, of course, the cleaning up goes into the millions. As I say, the figure now is like $40 million, not costing the medical care, the testing, leukemia, the health care, the animals, or the plants. Just they're talking about a $40 million cleanup or dump the place completely. Uh, it was a $1.1 billion project that may be closed forever. Mr. Harry Farrell, editor of the San Jose Mercury, has an article on Three Mile Island. He said he has a stock portfolio, and he noticed that his GPU stock was going down. It was an East Coast utility company, GPU meaning General Public Utilities, and then he found out that's the parent company of Metropolitan Edison in the Harrisburg area that owns the Harrisburg reactor. He noticed last week in the, that his stock of GPU was going down. And then two days after the stock started going down, he received what's the shareholders package. You know, those are those slick 36-page books with beautiful, uh, he calls beautiful topography and graphics. And the book opened up to the GPU's pride and joy in Harrisburg uh, called the High... It's an old hydraulic plant that brought power for 75 years, and now it's described as the most beautiful uh, general public utilities operation in the country, Three Mile Island, Pennsylvania, now completed a 1.1 billion two-unit nuclear station. These nuclear stations will provide 40% of our customers' current needs from one of our nation's most important sources of indigenous fuel, uranium. He received the brochure several days after his stock dropped. And, of course, there were beautiful pictures and a brochure telling them that they had invested $1.1 billion into that plant. And um, now they could sit back and enjoy the stock profits from the plant. Another article in the San Jose Mercury on the, on the fault of the plant that was built 
the brochure tells how they put this money, $1.1 billion, into this great plant. But what they didn't put in the brochure was six major malfunctions that were to take place just at the time the uh, product was being sold around the country. And I'm sure you've read of these, the feed water valve that had been closed, the electrically operated re relief valve that got stuck, the gauge telling the control room how much water uh, was in the pressure valve gave erroneous information. The thick concrete containment wall that was supposed to seal off radioactivity uh, didn't do the sealing off for several hours. The emergency core cooling system turned off prematurely, and then the decision to turn off the pumps on the reactor cooling system re uh, resulted in damaging to the core where the radioactive fuel was located. Uh, they hadn't anticipated the bubble. They had these great uh, flaws in the system and the brochure for the stockholders was telling them how great it was. Another article, Immediate uh, Danger Over at A Plant. This came out yesterday, April the 5th, and it goes into the cleanup costs. In Pennsylvania, it said we, we couldn't expect to find any more cancer deaths than the usual 4,500 for this population. In a town of that size, 4,500 is normally expected would have cancer, and yet they can't tell how many more over that is normal. Imagine living in a town with a normal cancer is 4,500 for that small amount of population. And this article is the one that said that to wipe up the radioactivity would cost at least 40 million. So there's a 1.1 billion investment, 40 million wipe up, and probably another 40 million in farmland and medical care in following this up for the next 20 years probably before uh, they can find out how bad the damage was. And of course, keep in mind that all these costs uh, are mounting and will continue to go on while just this last week, the government had to have Congress write out some more money because when they sent out the Social Security checks this month, they didn't have money to cover it in the Treasury. We have a country where people are working hard, saving money, Social Security, or have worked and expected and this country is so bankrupt on the eve of other wars and weapon costs and budgets for the Pentagon, and they had to hold up some money. Uh, Congress had to allocate money to make the Social Security checks good this month. So while we're totally bankrupt on the one hand and can't take care of the needs of the everyday citizen who's worked hard and uh, expects his money back right now in return, we can't take care of that, and yet we have to wipe up plans and plans that we had no provisions for in the first case, first place. Another article uh, yesterday in the Los Angeles Times, fatigue to blame in nuclear accident, in addition to the six malfunctions, six or more, at the nuclear plant, it turns out that the people working at Three Mile Island Nuclear Power Plant worked 40 consecutive days without a day off preceding the March 28th accident. And they worked 10-hour shifts. And the Edison Company made the remark that the Metropolitan Edison Company stated, I'm not aware of any rules applying to the number of hours a person can work. Our regulations are related to the amount of radiation they can take. Up to the time of the accident, they're working 10-hour shifts, 30, 40 days consecutively. I didn't know that anyone in the United States work like that. I knew they did it in Dachau and Auschwitz and Nazi concentration camps and I'm sure in the copper mines of Chile or wherever there's slave labor and exploitation. But in addition to the mechanical malfunctions that they hadn't even anticipated, they were working 40 consecutive days for 10 hours a day. I thought there was unemployment in this country. It, couldn't it be possible that people work eight hours a day and take five day a week and spread the employment. No wonder the pay is so good overtime for a handful of people. And yet these crews had these long hours and now there's a reason to believe that uh, the equipment failure might have to do with their just not being awake enough to understand and take care of what was happening. That to top all of that, there's an article in the San Francisco Chronicle, customers to pay for eight plants lost the customers who will use the electric company, the Metropolitan Edison Company, have to pay the 
$600,000 a day where they purchased power from an alternative source. Here were people overworked. They hadn't known about the bubble. The equipment had helped malfunction. But the metropolitan stockholders, their portfolio may go down a little bit, but the electric company stockholders will not have to pay to uh, take care of the plant's loss. No, the people that use the electricity, according to the newspaper this last week, are going to have to pay to get their alternate electricity in and pay for the loss of $600,000 a day to another electric company. That's really putting the salt in the wound, I think. And then, of course, there's the comfort that the Pennsylvania officials had the alternative to go underground, that there's radiation-proof bunkers as they were built in 1967, that the governor can descend into the bunker with cabinet members, state senate members, and political leaders, National Guardsmen, Capitol Police, and others invited by the governor. They have provisions in the bunker. It's underneath Harrisburg, and it's for state emergencies for 240 people for about four days. It's built uh, in case of an atomic bomb and uh, nuclear war or the fallout from nuclear war, and 240 people could always go under. I'm sure it would probably be the 240 people that pushed for this alternative energy, this atomic energy without known sources of uh, waste disposal that would run to the building first. I may sound a little bitter, but that's usually the way the figures go. And of course, I'm sure all of you were watching the news closely this week and felt like puking as you read about the uh, energy czar, Mr. Schlesinger, getting on national television just at the height of this terrible experience and not knowing if this place was going to blow up and whether the wind would go all over New Jersey, New York and contaminate the earth. Well, all of this was going on. The uncertainties were going on. Mr. James R. Schlesinger was asking uh, for more atomic plants. He was asking the president, in quotes, to speed up the licensing by which nuclear plants uh, are made or licensed and resolved. The, po the political part of holding up the um, new plant. He said that uh, they didn't go into the tricky question of disposing of nuclear waste. It hadn't been resolved, but he wants the president to speed up the nuclear plant. I mean, again, this is total, total insanity. We don't know what we're going to do with the waste, but speed up the plant. I'm sure all of you saw him on television. I have newspaper articles here. Schlesinger urges speed up of nuclear plant licensing. I have friends that watch the news media on TV, and of course I'm a newspaper reader because I can't file what Schlesinger says, even though it's interesting to see their faces on the screen. But I can't keep these articles and save them for a later date and refer to them. And uh, at the height of this horrible affair, which is costly in terms of energy and family lives and health and agriculture, industry, Schlesinger urges the speeding up of nuclear plants. And of course, right behind him is the very man that he had appointed, Dr. Joseph Malam Henry. If you want a biography of him, there's one in the New York Times. Uh, he's the man who was appointed the chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Jimmy Carter appointed him on that commission to handle this, and his job is to take care of the public and protect the public. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission is an independent agency set up in 1977 by President Carter to review these problems, and yet the uh, New York Times said that Dr. Henry was chosen by James Schlesinger, the same James Schlesinger that says, let's hurry up more plants. He's described in this article in the New York Times as he spent, it says, Dr. Henry spent most of his career promoting the expansion of nuclear power and is so committed to abundant nuclear power, he has sometimes abdicated his responsibility to safety. Now, here's a man who was supposed to be uh, assigned to protect us, who has abandoned all concern for safety and was put on there by James Schlesinger, who's urging us to go ahead with plants at a time when he sees that they're not safe. This article from the New York Times said there already are a number of controversies about Dr. Henry's chairmanship of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. He refused to release a memorandum he had written in 1972 
and when he was asked to do so under the Freedom of Information Act, later he relented at the request of Mr. Udall's committee. Uh, this gentleman is now chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission that is set to protect us, appointed by Jimmy Carter and selected by James Schlesinger to back up Schlesinger's desires for atomic plants. Not our needs or our health, but Schlesinger's desires. Another article this week, Argentina pressing ahead for A power. They're asking for port. $4.5 billion effort to build four more plants in Argentina to swi- take a swipe at the U.S. concern over Navy and over I mean, nuclear proliferation. Argentine wants $4.5 billion to build four more atomic plants. They have nuclear power right now in Latin America and Brazil and Mexico are building plants. Chile, per- Peru, and Uruguay have experimental plants but Argentina wants more. Maybe that would be one way to get rid of the Nazis in Argentina, except I'm sure they've built their bunkers there too and they could get rid of the natives, just leak the stuff out uh, like Hiroshima and Nagasaki, get rid of the natives and then have the rest of the country to yourself. Uh, They want more nuclear energy and uh, they flaunt it at the time of this accident. Give us more, more, we need more. Good luck. And then, of course, the drug companies always get into the act, the nuclear act. An article from the San Jose Mercury, quotations from the New York Times, search for a drug underscores the lack of nuclear preparedness. Huge Air Force C-130 jet transports went from Scott Air Force Base in Belleville, Illinois, to a laboratory in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, bringing little bottles of potassium iodide. People in Pennsylvania to take two drops a day but they didn't have enough immediately for the residents of the area. This is to avoid cancer of the thyroid gland. The Federal Bureau of Drugs uh, got in touch with two pharmaceutical companies, the Air Force, the Army, the State Police in two states. They got chartered jets and a company in New Jersey that makes droppers. They had 250,000 just the right size in stock, and they rounded up the Mellencrot Incorporated of St. Louis, M-A-L-L-I-N-C-R-O-D-T of St. Louis, and a plant decatur in Illinois, and then they had 11,000 one-ounce one-ounce bottles on the way to Pennsylvania. Park Davis and Company in Detroit is making some more of the drugs. They didn't have enough little bottles, so they sent it in 55-gallon drum drums, and another 93,000 one-ounce bottles were filled. Doherty Brothers, a major manufacturer of medicine droppers, was reached in New York City. There were 210,000 medicine droppers available by an army truck. 40,000 followed Monday. And now the medicine is being administered to persons working in the plant. And they have contingencies to get these one-ounce family bottles, given each member of the family, take two drops, one for children a day for 10 days, Professor Frank Von Hippel, a physicist at Princeton, is studying the consequence of nuclear accidents, and he met with the governor of New Jersey, and they're recommending that they get some of these drugs and stock them up. Uh, When I study the Nazis in America in Project Paperclip, I'm always interested in where those Nazi doctors and scientists went, and as you read these subjects, you see a preponderance of German names uh, involved in this. I don't know what's coincidental coincidental or I'm paranoid whether they come from Germany or not but uh, the Malin Krott Corporation and uh, Professor Frank von Hippel and many other names uh, throughout this I wonder if they are re- related to the original project paperclip that brought the Nazis to this country after World War II we never get a, a list of the 572 doctors who were brought in the United States. I wanted one for years, and I'd like to know where they are today and what drug companies they work for. And then just see if their names uh, cross over into any of these accidents that we're having or any of the so-called cures that bring up uh, these drugs. And again, in the nuclear uh, subject, John Connolly called for a speed-up of N plants. This was just days after the Harrisburg incident started. He said the environmentalists put constraints on the construction of nuclear power. This is from the Houston Post. And he's talking to a convention of national roofer contracts. That's very important for roofers who also make solar energy. And he tells them that we have to have nuclear energy. And, of course, the polls last week at the same time 
that John Conley was speaking three days later uh, put him third of GOP hopefuls. First Reagan, then Ford, and then John Conley. And that same week that he was third in the polls, he was pushing the speed up of end plants. There's such a contradiction here between the facts and sanity and the pushing of certain people for this in spite of the dangers that I just can't comprehend what's in their heads. On the, in the Conley article, there's some other little pointers uh, that are important in case you're thinking of voting for John Conley for president or Ronald Reagan. Uh, they're sympathetic to these points, and he brought them out of his speech. Conley criticized the nation's legislative branch for much of the major legislation of the past decade, which he would like to get rid of including, one, the Equal Pay Act of 1963, two, Age Discrimination Employment Act, three, Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, that protects us, four, the National Labor Relations Act, five, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and six, the Freedom of Information Act. If you elect John Conley, or Ronald Reagan, you can be sure that all six of these will be changed immediately. And he's third in line of popularity of the candidates for the Republican Party. And he threw in these six items, which, of course, would have to go if he were president of the United States. So much for the Harrisburg incident. We'll be Tape 383, it's April the 6th, 1979, May Brussels and Carmel, California. There was an ugly incident in San Francisco last Saturday night at a lesbian bar of some gentlemen, about 20 of them, plain clothesmen. Maybe there were fewer, but I think there were up to 20 plain clothesmen were at a party. A man was getting married the next day, and it was a bachelor party. And the men were drunk. They hired an electric uh, car, uh, similar to the cable cars in San Francisco, I understand, motorized car. And they were on a spree in town, and they all got together and decided, let's get the dikes. So they went down to the part of town where there's a lesbian bar, and they were very obnoxious, and they were drunk, and they were celebrating, as I say, the fact that this gentleman was going to get married the next day. So they decided to break the place up, and the women didn't want them, and they were abusive and drunk, and one of them grabbed a woman by the neck and had her on the floor, and they were beating her up, and they called the police, and the police came, and the group of people were playing clothes. They were officers of the police department, but it was their night off, and they were celebrating this marriage the next day, and they didn't have on their uniforms, and the woman asked for the driver's license of one of the men, uh, when they wanted to come in or some identification because they were so obnoxious and she didn't want to give it back and it identified them as being on the police force, I believe. Well, uh, some men were arrested and there was a lot of talk on the talk shows in San Francisco, but the San Francisco Chronicle yesterday had an article that um, the wedding that was to take place the next day was Patty Hearst's wedding and that the gentleman involved, the groom-to-be, was Bernard Shaw the uh, soon-to-be husband of Patty Hearst, and that his buddies on the police force were the ones that were in the brawl, beating up the women, going after the dykes and lesbians. Uh, Patty left one environment, was kidnapped, and uh, taken for a year and a half. And then uh, when she was in jail and out appealing her case, her bodyguard was this policeman, who has total control over her now. She's in a prison uh, 
it's a terrible situation. She had a military wedding at a Navy base. She's married to a member of the police department. You can see the dangerous, violent mentality the man has beating up uh, women. There's an article saying, a follow-up in the paper this morning, or just mentioning that the bachelor party was for Bernard Shaw, but that he wasn't in the crowd. But the earlier reports uh, had intimated that the bachelor party for the fellow officer, that he was there. So now we have to wait to see if he, in fact, was part of that brawl because it's been very silent in San Francisco. But I think it's a pretty sick situation, and uh, this is the kind of environment. The buddies that she's going to be with are the kind that, like the Klan, can go in and just beat up on women who are minding their own business in a place and feel that they have the authority to abuse people physically and uh, get away with it because they're members of the police department. It's just like Nazi Germany where the police have the authority to go in and mess up people. If you saw the movie Cabaret or other movies of the Nazi period, and they leave because the police are the Nazis and the Nazis are the police. And so that uh, Patty's husband, Bernard Shaw, uh, keeps this kind of company, and they think they have that kind of authority. So heaven help Patty Hearst, I think it's pretty bad. One uh, woman who takes these tapes asked me... Uh, what kind of psychic power do you use to keep optimistic when everybody else is low and blue and calm and they're ready to die or upset about the news? She wrote, what psychic powers do you use to keep happy or whole or what do you do? I can't explain what I do for my kicks, uh, at least not on the tapes, but I do get satisfaction in seeing the counterforces taking over. And I'm going to talk to you for a few minutes about some good news uh, Good news about bad news, and this comes from the New York Post, Friday, March 16, 1979. And this has to do about the Howard Hughes burglary, the break-in. Many of you people haven't followed the Howard Hughes case like I have through the years, and I consider myself pretty much an expert on the Howard Hughes case. And one of the big mysteries, one of the counterforces that's been building up, uh, like that bubble that wasn't expected in Harrisburg, was the burglary of the Romaine offices in Los Angeles. The Howard Hughes Empire was burg burglarized several years ago, and it had to be an inside job because they have the tightest security imaginable in that office. And goodness knows what could be taken out of that office because there were correspondence and documents. Uh, I even have some that were in the hotel in Mexico at the time that that body was turned in in 1976, were procured by Johnny Meyer, the former aide, of Howard Hughes, and they talked about giving Richard Nixon a million dollars down at uh, Key Biscayne, which would have to be for covering up the murder of Robert Kennedy, uh, because that's how Richard Nixon became president, and also giving Lyndon Johnson a million dollars, which had directly to do with the murder of John Kennedy, and keeping silent on that, because the assassination teams were headed by Robert Mayhew, employed by Howard Hughes, and the CIA used the Hughes as a cover. Now, what, the, what came out of the burglaries at the time was the little teensy easy tip of that famous iceberg. My goodness, there's so many little tips coming out now that we may even get a view of the iceberg someday. But it was the story of the Glomar Explorer and how the CIA had used the Hughes organization to retrieve a sunken Russian submarine. And uh, then that went into the investigation of the Howard Hughes connections to the Glomar. Now, all of us uh, sharing these tapes are reasonable people, and we know that the fact that you burglarize an office and take out the story that the Hughes organization built a submarine for the United States isn't that scandalous, really. Uh, they built satellite planes. The Lockheed built the U-2. They make spy planes and all kinds of spy equipment for the intelligence uh, community. So that's not really so scandalous, and we're not even really sure about the Russian story anyway because... They retrieved the bodies, and then they threw them over the side anyway, again, after saying a prayer in Russian, which doesn't make much sense either. But now there's two books coming out about the burglary at the Romaine Street, and this is the kind of thing which is important and which makes me have confidence that there are moles in this system. That's where I get my information from. I just assimilate it and correlate it. But there's a book coming out now called Citizen Hughes, in his own words, how Howard Hughes tried to buy America. By It's Holt Reinhardt. It's coming out in the fall. The author is Michael Drosnan. Now, 
the New York Post said Drozen refuses to comment on the report that he obtained secret papers from the world's most secretive man. He only said, I have virtually everything that Hughes himself ever wrote, plus a whole lot more. But he has a book coming out on the burglary, and this is the important thing about that book. There's thousands of secret documents and private papers that were stolen in 1974, just at the height and heat of Watergate. Just at the time, the Watergate story could link to the John Kennedy assassination. That I had made those connections just at the time Richard Nixon was going out of office and the people succeeding him were part of the cover-up, Jerry Ford from the Warren Commission. Uh, at this time, in 1974, those offices were removed of papers and the details of this book that is coming out, How Howard Hughes Tried to Buy America, goes into the financial dealings from the CIA to Richard Nixon to the Kennedys to Lyndon Johnson, and it reports to have a lot of important information that should be very uh, beneficial to studying our whole era. The Howard Hughes name is deleted from the biography, the index of almost every single book on espionage and intelligence and you have to ask yourself why because like General Reinhard Galen and uh, uh, I think he's the most important man next to uh, James Jesus Angleton you have Howard Hughes and that name has been deleted because that is one of the umbrellas for the Nazification of America there is no and was no physical use really important after 1946 and certainly never after 57 never seen again and we'll go into that when we talk about who and how and why this country is the way it is. And the important thing is that uh, the Howard Hughes organization, if I could say one group, represented the Nazification of America, it would be under the guise of the Howard Hughes organization. Many of you read in the paper last week under the Freedom of Information Act that was declassified that uh, in order to handle the campus riots in the 60s, they were using word for word the speeches of Adolf Hitler. Well, G. Gordon D Liddy was down in the archives, National Archives, watching Gestapo pictures. He worked for the Howard Hughes organization. G. Gordon Liddy did. He was with Robert Mardian and E. Howard Hunt. That gang were over at Mullen Associates, which was an office uh, for the Howard Hughes organization. Now, this burglary uh, was done by as an inside job, and as I said, there's there are two books coming out on the Howard Hughes burglary. One, use how he tried to buy America. I'm sorry that word is in the past tense, how they bought America. And then another book by Jim Steele and Donald Barlett uh, from the Philadelphia Inquirer. They have a book called Empire. Norton is publishing it. It'll come out next month. This is, refers to a chapter on the burglary, the same burglary, called the Hughes Gate, the Water Gate of the Hughes Empire and they don't answer the question of who masterminded the plot or what was stolen or the options, but that they, they go into uh, CIA contracts, a little bit about the Glomar, but other documents that were stolen from that office, according to the New York Post, and I know this is true, include transactions with Nixon, with LBJ, with Hubert Humphrey, and the Kennedys on how one man tried to buy the government. Now, this is very important because... The past tense is used twice to describe the book. But Howard Hughes was in a plane crash that was near fatal in 1946. The plane crash was just two blocks from my parents' home. I might have mentioned that on other tapes, just two blocks from our home. And directly across the street where some of their cohorts uh, were, where Bugsy Siegel was murdered on Linden. The crash for Howard Hughes testing a plane in 1946. And he almost died. And he had Dr. Vern Mason save his life and from that time on because of broken ribs and extensive complications Mason was in charge of Howard and it was at that time with pain and so forth that they began the medications later in 1957 they declared uh, Howard mentally incompetent and Vern Mason went on to head the Hughes Medical Institute in Miami and Hughes was never seen again now the years that we're talking about the years that we're, these books are describing that involve Richard Nixon and LBJ or the Kennedys or Hubert Humphrey are after the time in 1957 when Hughes was never seen, never seen again. And according to the documents, he was doped out of his head for 20 years 
if you would believe he existed the full length up to 76, and I believe it was till 71, he was filled with needles, drugs, incoherent, and so forth, and people were writing and using his name because even at the time of the Clifford Irving book, the best experts of the world from McGraw Hill and Life Magazine and Osborne and company and so forth said, yes, those are Howard Hughes' handwritings, those are his letters, his memos, and later they turned out to be a fraud. So the same person could be writing the memos through the years if they couldn't tell the difference in 1971, 72. They could have been writing them since, uh, oh, for a long, long time. But the years that they're talking about where he tried to buy the government, and this is important. I don't want to go too fast. And we'll do more, of course, when the books come out. He wasn't even existing. He was, this man lived in a bungalow at the Beverly Hills Hotel, uh, was pri- provided with drugs by Jack Agar of the Beverly Hills Police Department and Bobby Hall and a gang around him. He was in that bungalow from 1957 to 1966 where he was taken to a Boston hospital and never seen, he was never seen publicly. A doctor came up from Youth Medical Institute in Miami. The director of that great institution was the doorman originally. And then again, he was taken on a train to Las Vegas and exited there in the hands of Intertel uh, police force in 1970 Thanksgiving night and he was not seen anywhere in Las Vegas. So all the manipulations and all the papers and documents that are coming out from the Romaine burglary were the works of people using the Howard Hughes name. Oh, I promised you last week that I would get back to Jonestown and do some more on Michael Prokes and uh, important information on Jonestown, but I thought I would just take a break this week and do an update on some of these matters because they are important, and uh, I want to clear them out with you and not hold on to the information. I did an article for Penn Jones Continuing Inquiry um, uh, called The Missing Link two months ago uh, about John Paisley, missing John Paisley, and the connections to Yuri Nosenko, the KGB defector, uh, Marianne Paisley of the CIA, John and Catherine Hart of the CIA, and Bernard Fensterwald, the attorney representing Marianne Paisley. Um, in response to that article, Victor Marchetti, who wrote the book The Cult of Intelligence, answered with a letter which was printed in the next issue of Penn Jones newspaper, and of course he accused me of errors in the article and didn't address himself to the important questions. And I responded with another letter to Penn, and I brought up uh, the question in the letter of how can you trust CIA people who write books such as Victor Marchetti and even John Marks, who was the co-author of The Cult of Intelligence, that CIA agents are writing books, ex-CIA agents still belong to the CIA, they're trained to lie under oath, and I brought out in this last issue that uh, pen will pr- hopefully print in the next uh, in- continuing inquiry that if you look in the index of the cult of intelligence by Victor Marchetti who claimed he had left the CIA he leaves out two names and one is General Reinhard Galen, chief of Hitler's Eastern Intelligence and the other was James Jesus Angleton and I made the point that if you don't write about James Jesus Angleton and Reinhard Galen uh, it's identical to not learning the alphabet of the English language. In the intelligence alphabet of the CIA, A. Allen Dulles, B. Angleton, or B. Galen and C. Angleton, counterintelligence. And a man who writes a whole book explains the American people about the CIA and leaves out the name Galen and James James Jesus Angleton, and also Howard Hughes, is not telling us the whole story. Also, Marchetti claims that the Galen operation was literally a nest of communist spies that Richard Helms didn't trust Galen and didn't even see him when he had a farewell tour in his retirement. Um, I understand, and according to the books on Galen, that at, up till 1971 he received $200 million from the CIA and with inflation and with the Galen agents still being paid, and it's eight years later, I would say it's gone into eight or ten or twenty uh, times the 200 million up to 1971 and I don't think that's all for communists and I asked uh, him Mr. Victor Marchetti to please address himself 
to one specific point I made in the continuing inquiry, and that was this. When the Warren Commission was writing their report in 1964, they were approached by the CIA through Isaac Don Levine to bring the daughters of Alexander Zeiger from the Minsk Radio Factory back to Argentina where they were born. And I want Victor Marchetti to answer in the continuing inquiry a letter, why would the CIA be concerned with helping the man who ran the radio factory where Lee Harvey Oswald worked in the Soviet Union and the family that introduced Marina to Lee. Why, while the Warren Report is being written, would they want to bring that family back to Argentina? And I think that would be a good starting point for Victor Marchetti to explain uh, how his logic and his facts operate in this case. And if he continues to correspond on this matter, you will see loud and clear that people that proclaim to be ex-CIA people are still very much acting for the CIA. Now, an update on that book, Alternative 3, that I talked about uh, on several tapes two weeks ago and the week before that. There was a conference the University of California gave in Monterey, my hometown, next to Carmel, last weekend on space. It was a conference on the greatness of space. It was a $60 um, uh, credit course, Santa Cruz extension, a voyage of discovery, sponsored by the University of California. One of the speakers there, a friend of mine who also takes these tapes, went to hear it because he used a press pass. It was too late for me to get over to hear this. I wish I had. Uh, one of the speakers was Dr. Brian O'Leary from Princeton University, and he works with that Dr. O'Neill who's written up in Alternative 3, in the book o Alternative 3. O'Leary is a specialist on the mining of asteroidal materials for manufacturing in space. He says the Earth resources will be depleted, and the man has to think of space leave living as the answer to more energy, food, and room to live. And as I say, he collects material for living in space. He was asked, uh, did he know the book Alternative 3? And he said no. And he was asked about um, spaceman Robert Groden, and he wasn't familiar with that name. Another speaker who was supposed to be there that evening, the main speaker, was Russell Schweikert who was the lunar mod module pilot for Apollo 9 in 1969 and sent up the uh, backup for the first Skylab mission in 1973. He worked on the jammed solar wing that lost its thermal shield during the Skylab launch. Schweikert is an advisor to Governor Brown on space-related matters and works for NASA. Now, it's interesting. The conference was this last weekend, last Friday, here on the peninsula, but when the Harrisburg incident took place on Thursday, Schweikert was called by Governor Brown to cancel his speech at the Monterey Conference Center that was an extension course, three-day course, because of possible problems of the plant, nuclear plant, up in Sacramento. Now, it's interesting that a NASA space scientist, a, an actual astronaut, would be going up to California to work on nuclear plant safety. But Governor Brown called him up to Sacramento and because of the Harrisburg incident so that the atomic energy plants and the pollution of the earth and the solution of the earth seem to be in the hands of the same people. The theory between alternative three is the world will be so polluted that we need an alternative place to live and it's being polluted by the same people that are planning the solution. And if that doesn't make you wonder, uh, think about it a little while. We've known that's been going on a long time. To put our safety and our food and our health and our future or our present in the hands of the very people who are doing the polluting uh, certainly uh, doesn't make sense any more than letting James Schlesinger push for more plants at a time when he doesn't even know the damage that the current one is doing. Another article along the lines of Alternative 3, because certainly I read the news not differently, but with that book in mind, there was an article last Thursday in the Monterey Herald Associated Press story from Switzerland that said one-tenth of all babies born last year may die before their first birthday, that 125 million children were born in 1978, and 12 million will die in their first year. But then Halfdan, Dr. Halfdan Mahler, said in Switzerland that this again is the tip of the iceberg, another famous tip of the iceberg. 
He said an even greater tragedy is, will come because the survivors from the first year, because of economic, social, or environmental conditions, will never enjoy the fruit of good health or develop to their full human potential. That goes back again to people like Cecil Rhodes and their diamond mines and their superiority of the white race, the white Anglo-Saxon, and working the Africans for slave labor and deciding who lives and dies. In Alternative 3, it brings up the problem of 34 million new people born each year. But you can see, if you take rid of 12 million children uh, from the undeveloped countries, that's 12 from 34 right there, and you can easily with famine, earthquakes, and disease, uh, balance it off so you don't have any particular growth from these people uh, each year. And furthermore, it suggests if you're poor or in the worst social uh, location, you know, socially, I suppose, as black, Mexican, Muslim, or Indian, or whatever, and your environment is bad, there will be a greater tragedy because you'll never enjoy the fruit of good health or develop your potential. I want to do a lot more on the South African uh, scandal, the payoffs of $86 million to politicians, but I don't want you to lose sight of a small article. It was so tiny you may not have seen it this week in uh, lieu of the British elections that took place um, at the time that the story broke about the payoffs from South Africa. One of the recipients of the money was Margaret Thatcher, the leading uh, Britain, British conservative who was running for office against Prime Minister James Callaghan, and the scandal was that South Africa had poured money into Margaret Thatcher's administration. Two weeks ago, on tape number 381, March 23rd, I also commented about the uh, scandal of the South African murder of Robert Smith and his wife, who were murdered a week before the general elections down in South Africa. I titled it Murderous Twist in South Africa, a another death just before the elections down there, common up here and common all over the world. They had the elections Thursday, March 29th in uh, England for the British government, and the Washington Post has a frontline headline story, British government ousted by one vote. James Callaghan uh, lost uh, the election as the prime minister, and they're going to have a general election now early in May, and the Conservative Party leader, Margaret Thatcher, uh, is going to run for election. There's no, no confidence in the Callahan vote. The Washington Post has a great big story on that subject. The New York Times has a front page story by William Broders. Labor government is ousted in Britain by vote in Commons, the House of Commons. Callahan beaten by margin of one. Election likely in early May. Now, both of these made front page stories that Margaret Thatcher uh, would likely run for election in May and possibly win, and that Prime Minister James Callaghan would be leaving the office of 10 Downing Street. It made the headlines all over and with a lot of fanfare and nobody making any connections to the possibility of the influence of the uh, possible $86 million secret fund that South Africa uses in the United States and in Britain and also other countries, to affect their elections. But the United Press had a story in the San Francisco Chronicle this last week, and if you measure it, I could give you the sentences. There's just two inches, and I haven't seen it in my other papers. I'm waiting to see uh, what comes from the New York Times and Washington Post. This is from London, April the 3rd, 1979, United Press. British pro politician dies, and it, it's true he's 76 years old. He's old enough to die. Um, he's a man that had the deciding vote in the Labor Party, Sir Alfred Broughton, a Labor Party member of Parliament, was absent from the Commons No Confidence Vote debate March 28th. He had an illness that brought him down, and James Callaghan died. He died from bronchitis, and he died from a heart attack, and he was inconveniently 250 miles away from Parliament to vote and he was a member of the Labor Party and one of the strong whips with Callahan and um, he just unfortunately got the heart attack and died and didn't vote this would be the deciding vote in whether or not uh, Margaret Thatcher 
would win or not. And in lieu of the fact that South African money was mentioned in regard to her political campaign and success, in lieu of the fact that another murder took place by the same conduits a week before the election, I think it would be interesting to know why uh, the headlines wouldn't at least proclaim that Sir Alfred Broughton, the deciding factor in that election, also had a heart attack and died. And uh, there's just too many deaths that take place that are deciding around these electoral processes for me to believe that they're just coincidental. Through the Freedom of Information Act that was just declassified this last week, April the 12th, again, uh, these documents are coming out, and these are the things that John Conley wants to stop from being released. The United Press story says, at the height of the Cold War, the Central Intelligence Agency studied and looked into ways to knock off key guys through what they term natural causes such as cancer and heart attacks. A heavily censored CIA document from a quarter century ago shows that the CIA considered experimenting on terminal cancer cases under the guise of legitimate medical work. We know that Jack Ruby had a CIA cancer and Margaret Mitchell, Martha Mitchell rather, had a CIA cancer, but the information coming out, the research from the Assassination Information Bureau was released that they were investigating ways to knock off people, methods to produce cancer, methods for heart attacks, and so forth. And I told you before that uh, I have talked to a gentleman who said that he gave the heart attack to William Harvey of the CIA just after he testified before the Senator Church Committee. February 4th, 1952 memo on chemical branch research and development, give heart attacks and give cancer. It's hard to believe that they started that far back using this as a weapon and didn't perfect it to the point that they can use it all the time right now. Jimmy Carter was in Dallas, Texas just days before, several days before the nuclear incident in, uh, in Pennsylvania, and he was talking to the National Public and Radio Mutual Broadcasting people giving a lecture in Dallas, Texas. Did you know there was a plan to kill Jimmy Carter in Texas and that the only newspaper that I have that wrote about it was the Washington Post, Saturday, March 17, 1979. It said, warrant issued in death plot against Jimmy Ca uh, Carter. A federal warrant was issued for a Texas man who the Secret Service agents had paid $10,000 to have Carter assassinated. This man has been arrested. His name is William Rodney Etheridge, 23, of Odessa, Texas. He's wanted from the state of Utah. He's a fugitive from justice in Utah. Remember the same man that uh, told me about the plan to kill Harvey that he did with the fake heart attack, that the original orders come from Utah and that uh, Utah is involved in these assassinations. Why is it that only the Washington Post wrote an article that a man was arrested and that there was a death plot on the United States president, this came out March 17th, that the man was arrested. Jimmy Carter was down in Dallas on the 23rd. The reason there was so much silence is that they want to do it, and they don't want to break the chain of command of the people who will kill him if they want to get away with it. Laura on Jonestown next week. Sorry the tape is up. Again, it goes too fast. Take care, and I'll be with you next week.